There are a lot of different chart types out there, and so choosing which one to use for your data can be a bit of a challenge. The good news is, though, that when it comes to communicating data in a business setting, a fairly standard and common set of charts will often serve your purposes. That being said, though, rarely is there one right way to visualize data. Any given data set can be graphed in multiple different ways, and so therefore exploring and iterating through different views will allow you to see things differently. You should always look to dedicate some time to choosing an effective visual. And to begin this process, we highly recommend moving away from your tools and sketching. I've talked about the benefits of sketching in a previous video, which I'll list in the description below. For me, I like to try out ideas on my iPad to help determine which graph to use. Let's take a look at this iterative process with today's example. This table is looking at a data set of glucose observations from participants in an experimental trial. If the proposed treatment were causing any blood sugar related side effects, they would be visible here. Pause for a moment and see what you can easily observe about the trends. Now with this particular example, it's important to note that there isn't any specific insight that we're looking to bring out and emphasize here. More so, we're looking to provide this data in a more digestible format, and maybe part of a regular ongoing report. That way the researchers and physicians can look for shapes, patterns, and trends. Now within the current data set, those shapes, patterns, and trends are a little bit difficult to see. So let's get sketching. First up, I'm gonna begin with a table, albeit simplified from the original. Because I've drawn it out, I haven't included the repetitive and unnecessary information from the original. As a format, the data table is intuitive and familiar to almost any audience. I can foresee a scenario where someone would need to look up precise glucose measurements, which is easier to do with a table than a graph. However, by leveraging our verbal communication system, tables do require a lot of cognitive effort to process. For example, it's tricky to quickly see the trend in those glucose levels. That was a solid, if a little unspectacular effort there. So I'm gonna to continue to explore and sketch out some of the graph chart options that we might consider. Box plots are designed to show distributions and my data set contains distribution measures like average and standard deviation. You might imagine this being a good match. The problems with this sketch started with the data for day three. There's just one observation and thus would lead to a box plot without a box. A closer look revealed that this would be the case for most of the days in the data. A box plot without boxes? Hmm, not sure. The other challenge is the box plot isn't generally considered a well-known chart type and an unfamiliar audience could face a steeper learning curve trying to make sense of them. In this case, it's likely that the researchers and physicians involved in the study have familiarity with the chart type as they consume a lot of scientific information. Nevertheless, I'm not a huge fan of this view. I'd say it was worth sketching just to rule it out, but let's continue to iterate. But before we do, let me share something with you. The next cohort of our ever popular eight week course is beginning soon. So if you are looking to take the next steps or members of your team in crafting effective presentations, then join me and fellow data storyteller, Amy, where we'll be immersing ourselves in the world of storytelling with data through live weekly lectures, regular synthesized activities, and a final course project presentation, all with regular feedback provided along the way with office hour sessions, including those in European friendly times. Now spaces are limited and going fast. For more details, check out storytellingwithdata.com forward slash workshops, and even better news, use code YouTube10 for 10% off registration price. Here's to your next stellar presentation. All right, now let's get back to those sketches. Due to plots are essentially box plots that show all individual points while still giving a sense of the distribution. Personally, I find them to be a highly intuitive way to display the distribution of a data set. I also felt better about the lack of observations from days three to 19 in this version compared to that previous box plot. The biggest downside to me was that depending on the tool, you ultimately use to create the final version, the jitter distribution effect can be a little bit cumbersome to create, especially for cohorts with more observations. Now this is a benefit to sketching first. I can experiment with novel approaches and decide if it's worth the effort to learn how to build. 
Ultimately, I concluded that the jitter plot was a viable option, if a little bit challenging to create. So I'm gonna keep exploring and see if there's any other suitable chart types we can consider that might be a little bit easier to create. Here, I simplified things by drawing one dot to represent the average glucose reading across all observations for each day. Now, I'm not sure here, I don't know, it feels a little bit too simple. And while it worked, I continued to iterate and converted this dot plot into a line chart. Now with continuous time-based data, as we have in this case, a line chart can often be a suitable option. The challenge here though, is that the observations in my data set weren't collected at regular intervals. So if I were to remake this in my tool, I need to spread out the days to show equally spaced intervals for each day, regardless of whether or not there were any observations taken. Otherwise, I risk distorting the data. For instance, making the increase in average readings between days three and seven seem much more extreme than it was. While sketching, I added red arrows just to remind myself of this. Now, one benefit of plotting the averages rather than individual observations is that I created a lot of space on the chart. I can use that space now to add reference lines, additional context for the overall study average and standard deviation. With this additional space, we could also afford to add a little more detail back in with the number of observations for each day. Here's a sketch of how that might look. Now I like this view and I propose to use this for my finished version, creating it in my tool Excel in this case, giving myself a reminder as I do so to use those regular time intervals. And here is the final version. The next time you're asking yourself, which chart should I choose? Set a timer for between five and 10 minutes and just sketch out all the possible ideas from that set of fairly common standard chart types. Then at the end of that process, take a look at your ideas, analyze the pros and cons of each, or even better yet, get some feedback and some suggestions from friends or colleagues as well. Now, sketching out ideas is a fantastic start in your process, but we need to do more to bring our graphs to light once we have built them and showcase the important elements to our audience. For that, take a look at this video. And until next time, thank you very much for watching and goodbye.